morning, everyone. Turn your Bibles with me to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. <coughs> 2 Peter chapter 1. The title of my sermon this morning is A Partaker of the Divine Nature. Does that sound like something that's appealing to you? Um, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 4. 2 Peter 1, 1 through 4. Um, anyone in the back want to read and help me out this morning? Okay, David. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained the precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby we are given unto us exceedingly great and <coughs> precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So how does Peter describe the promises of God? Exceeding great, Exceeding great and precious. So we were talking about some of those things this morning uh, with our prayers and, and the promises of God that we can claim. Uh, they are exceeding great and precious. And the promises of God are not just great, but exceeding great. I mean, there's words here used that are, are it's, not just, it's not just good, it's, it's exceeding great. And so um, what makes them so great is that they are the words of God himself. And the, the word of God has the same creative power that brought the worlds into existence. You remember, it's by the word of the Lord that the heavens were made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. So the word of God has power. Peter reminds us that it is God's divine power that has provided everything that we need, not only to sustain our physical life here on earth, but also godliness. He disdain, sustains our spiritual life through the knowledge of him. And so we, we, we get physical and spiritual help from God. By knowing the Father and His Son, Jesus, we are assured of having everything we need for this life and also godliness, the preparation needed for the eternal life given to us and, and for the future uh, in heaven. Peter says we are called to glory and virtue in these verses. In Philippians 3.14, Paul refers to the same calling we have all received as followers of Christ. He says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He calls it a high calling, and it is a high calling. We don't value that high calling as we should. We don't conceive of what it means to be sons and daughters of God. We really don't fully grasp exactly what that means. Peter says that we are called to glory. This is back in, in uh, 2 Peter verses 1 through 4. It says we're called to glory, a most exalted state. We get a glimpse of the honor and glory God wishes to shower upon us when we look at verse 17 in the same chapter. It says, and this is speaking uh, of Jesus, and it says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The father, if you remember the Holy Spirit, from the father came down. The father's own glory lit upon his son. Um, and this is what it's talking about. Uh, the same word uh, is you in verse three talking about glory. It's the same glory, the same word that's used when speaking of Jesus' glory.
If our faith is fixed upon the Son of God, we have his life and the honor and the glory that's due to him. You know, that's where, it's, that's where it all comes from. It's from the Son. Uh, 1 John 3, 2 promises, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We have to have a, a correct understanding and a knowledge of God. We have to see him as he is. And if we do so, if God gives us that revelation, that revelation of himself can change us into his own image. And most precious is the thought that God the Father can say, this is my beloved son or daughter in whom I am well pleased. God can say that about you and he can say that about me if we have that glory. 2 Peter 1.3 says we are not only called to glory, but also to virtue. Virtue is right thoughts, feelings, and actions. It is moral goodness and excellence. That's what we're called to. The fruit of virtue is good things such as humility, modesty, and purity. Those sound like good things we all desire. And Peter says that we are called to glory and virtue. Paul in his epistle to the Romans in, to Romans in chapter 11, verse 29, says that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So God's gifts and God's calling are without repentance. What that means for you and me is that God does not change his mind and repent or take back or recall the gifts that he's given to us. We know that every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father. That's from James 1.17. But what is the means of obtaining God's intended blessing of being called to glory and virtue? According to, to what we've read this morning in 2 Peter 1-4, through 4, what is the means of obtaining God's intended blessing of being called to both glory and and virtue. How does God do it? Okay, his divine power. That, that's, that's definitely a part of it. The knowledge, the, the knowledge of him. Second Peter 1 4. How does it start? What's the first word? Whereby. Whereby. So this is the means. Whereby denotes the channel of an act. In other words, Peter is telling us the means or the way to fulfill God's calling us to glory and virtue. He's telling us how this happens. And what is the means? What does God use to transform us? What does it say there? Promises. Promises. That's right. It says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature the calling and the glory are found in the promises of God. It's the means that we become partakers of the divine nature. And not only that, not only are we partaker, partakers of the divine nature, it says that this is the way that we escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. This is the means that God uses. What are we partakers of? The divine nature. Does the divine nature contain glory and virtue? Yes, it does. I mean, when you think of the divine nature of God and his son, and that we can be partakers of that, it's pretty amazing. What a marvelous exchange. The divine nature which Adam forfeited by his sin is restored. The promises of God have the power to restore us to the image of God himself. It's found in his promises. And, partake, and by partaking of the divine nature, Peter points out we escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. God's design is that we exchange Adam's fallen nature of lust for sin and become partakers of the divine nature and have lives filled with glory and virtue. But what does it take for the promises of God to become effectual to us? What do you think? What does it take for a promise that God has spoken with his own mouth? What does it take for that to become effectual 
and for it to be the faith. faith. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard faith and belief. That's truth. Hebrews 11, uh, 11, 6. Let's turn there quickly. Hebrews 11, 6. You want to read that? So we can't please God without faith. And if we're coming to God, we have to believe that he is the one um, that rewards those who diligently seek him. We have to have faith. We have to have faith in the promises of God. So the two conditions of pleasing God and therefore benefiting from his promises, number one is faith, and the other is diligently to diligently seek him. Um, and we're going to be talking about conditions. Um, the promises of God are the reward of those who believe God and diligently seek him. But to claim God's promises without diligently seeking and following him is not faith, but presumption. And more often than not, we see presumption, uh, people claiming God's prom- promises without actually exercising faith or diligently seeking him. And that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit today. God's promises are not a blank check for us to write any time we want to. You know, we talked about um, in Sabbath school, God knows what's best for us. He knows what we need. We, sometimes we think we need things that we don't need. And if we ask according to his will, even Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. You know, he didn't want to to go through the pain and the struggle, but he knew this was God's will, and he chose the Father's will instead of his own. God's promises have conditions that forfeit the promise if we do not meet them. Um, That may be a hard thing for for some people to to, uh, swallow, but it's true, and we're going to look at God's word this morning uh, to see that it is true. And faith is more than believing in the word of God, in his power in existence. James 2.19 tells us even the devils believe these things and they tremble. You know, faith is more than that. The book Steps to Christ, page 63, gives a, a definition of faith that I have not been able to find a better one. And so um, I'm going to read that to you now. It says, where there is not only a belief in God's word, but a submission of the will to him, where the heart is yielded to him, the affections fixed upon him, there is faith, faith that works by love and purifies the soul. So that's what it means to have true faith in God. It's not only believing the promise, but it's also complying, submitting your will to God and complying with the conditions. Faith empowers us to believe the promises of God, but we need to understand God's command as well as his promise. We need to obey his command and claim his promise. We talked about this a little bit a couple weeks ago in Sabbath school, that's kind of what prompted uh, where I went this morning uh, with this sermon. On the same page, Uh, 63 in Steps to Christ, we find another aspect that ties this all together. It says, Our only ground of hope is in the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, and in that wrought by his Spirit working in and through us. So it's Christ's Spirit that works in, in and through us. We talked this morning in Sabbath school about even repentance is a gift. You know, we don't, have to, we don't have to wait until uh, we have repented to come to Christ. We come to Christ for repentance. He can give us that repentance when we know that we have offended God, when we know that we've done something wrong. We can come to Jesus, and he can give us that repentance. He can give us that sorrow that we need. Um, a lot of times people feel like they have to do something 
before they can come to Jesus. But our only hope is Jesus. We have to, we have to um, trust ourselves to his care. The divine nature we receive by faith in the promises of God is the life and divine nature of the Son of God, his spirit working in and through us. His spirit accomplishes the promises in us, brings us to glory and virtue, and it is his divine power that gives us all things. Let's turn uh, back a few pages, 2 Corinthians 317. 2 Corinthians 317. It says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Lord, if you read uh, in the context of what Paul is talking about, he often calls Jesus Lord. He calls God the Father God. Jesus is the Lord. He says, The Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The divine nature to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. That is the divine nature. It's the spirit. And we can become partake, be partakers of the spirit of Jesus. As we behold Jesus, and I'm going to read verse 18. It says, we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It tells you that it's the Spirit of the Lord that changes us as we behold him. As we behold Jesus, we become partakers of his divine nature, his glory and virtue. And this is all accomplished by his Spirit. Do you want to become a partaker of the divine nature? Is that something that you desire? I know I do. Do you know the promises of God? I know we know some of them. Our, our bank account, probably, and I, I'm speaking for myself, but our bank account of promises is pennies compared to what the millions that God has given us at our disposal. But we, we seem to be satisfied with the pennies. It's pretty, pretty sad. How do you claim something you have no knowledge of? You know, it's like, how, how will they hear unless there's a preacher to, to tell them? How do you claim something if you have no knowledge of it in the word of God? How do you know you have a package at the post office? How do you know? Seriously, how do you know you have a package? Okay, there, there's something that tells you you have a package. Well, God has put in his word, his promises for us. He's telling you, you have a package. How's, what's the only way you're going to go get that? What's the only way that that slip of paper is going to do you any good? You've got to go to the post office and get your package. You know, we're, we're so feeble. We don't. God tells us there's a package, but, but we don't go and pick it up. Have you read God's promises and conditions? We're going to take a look a little bit today, just so you know that I'm not, what I'm saying is true. Um, I want to make this practical today, so let's prove from the Word of God how this works, okay? So if we want to know uh, how we can benefit from God's promises, let's prove how this works. Turn in your Bibles with me back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Someone uh, willing to read loudly uh, verses 1 through 4. Nancy.
through verse 4. That's good enough for our purposes. So what was God's command? Get out, get out, of, God. Get out of your country and go where? Go fly land to a somewhere down the road until I get lazy. Yeah, kind of that way. What was God's promise? He will bless him. You know, you make of thee a great nation. Those that curse you will be cursed. Those that blessed you will be blessed. I mean, this, this was a big thing. This was a big promise. What did Abraham do? It said he departed, verse 4, which you, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. Why did Abraham act on God's word? He believed. That's right. Let's, faith. Let's turn uh, ahead of just a few chapters here. Genesis 15. And we'll read verse 6. Who wants to read that? Then he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So you see, through the promise of God, Abraham became a partaker of the divine nature. He was doing God's glory. He was doing God's will. He was doing God's virtue. He was doing the things that made it possible for him to become a partaker of the divine nature. There was a command. There was a promise. Fulfill the command. The promise is, is fulfilled to you. Um, and that's the way it works. Do we understand what it means to claim a promise of God? Do we understand all the conditions? Going to the place where God led him was only one condition to the promise. A lot of times uh, people think that, that um, you know, it's a very simple, you know, you can go to the Bible in one place and find something. And you, can, you think that you can claim that as a promise without seeing the big picture. But you have to know all of the conditions for the promise to be fulfilled. And also God's revelation of what he wants you to, to do today may not be what he has in mind for you tomorrow. And so our only safety is to live up to the light that we have right now and, and what God has asked us to do right now. If we're living up to all of that light, if we're living up to the light of God's commands, if we're living up uh, and, and claiming the promise, then God can, can, can fulfill that. But if there's parts that we've left out, God's going to have a hard time uh, fulfilling his word. And uh, as we go on, we'll see that. Uh, let's go over two chapters to Genesis 17. Genesis chapter 17, and let's read 1 and 2. Who would like to read that? Okay, so what, is this different than God's previous command? First he just says, go, leave your country and go to a place that I'm going to show you. Now what, what is God's command now? He says, walk before me and be thou perfect. That's a big, that's a big thing to do, to, what, to be perfect before God. Of course, we know that all of God's Biddings are enablings. Whatever God asks us to do, he will give us the power to do if we act upon it. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, uh, that's part of the, um, 
obedience. You know, when, we, when, we, when it's in our heart to obey God, then he makes up for our deficiencies. I think you may have, you may have quoted that. I can't remember if you, you read that in Sabbath school today or not. But um, We know what God's command was. What was his promise in, in Genesis 17, verse 2? It says, I will make my covenant between me and thee and multiply thee exceedingly. So it's the same promise. God is, is, is telling Abraham the same promise that he's going to multiply him exceedingly, but a little extra information is added to how Abraham can comply and make God's promise to be fulfilled. It wasn't just going out and, do, and, and leaving. Now it's walk before me and be perfect. And God gives us a revelation of his will, sometimes gradually, not all at once. Um, turn ahead. A couple of chapters again. Genesis 22. Verse 22. And uh, let's read 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2. Who wants to read that for me? And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and give thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Okay, when it uses, uh, the, the King James Version uses the word tempt, what does that mean? If you read, yeah, test, or it says prove. So God's proving him whether he's going to, to do what he asked him to do. Um, was the promise of God still in effect? The promise that he had told him at the very beginning? Yes. Was that still in effect? Yes. yes, it was. Had God withdrawn his promise to make a great nation and to bless Abraham? No, he had not. But here God gives additional information that Abraham has to act upon. What was God's command? Go and, offer your son. Go and offer your son. What made God test Abraham so much? What had Abraham done that made God test him? I'll ask everybody else what they think. I know what I think. What I think? Well, God... Abraham had failed to demonstrate faith in God that he would fulfill his promise by taking Hagar, his handmaid. He had failed the test of faith because God said, I will do this. God had promised it, but Abraham was not uh, exercising faith in that promise when he took a handmaid. He believed his wife. But Abraham didn't know it was a handmaid, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't his wife. It was a slave, or it was a slave or a handmaid. But God said it was going to be from Sarah, right. and obviously Abraham failed that test. So God had to give him a, another test, um, and that's that's what I understand. I was just going to say what's interesting here is that not only did he not fulfill the promise yet, he's adhering to asking to do something that's going to take away the potential of that happiness. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not kill. So that, to me, that's what really made it very, very difficult. Was that Abraham almost had to go in that, you know, just the sense of when he saw the cloud over the Mount Moriah, that it was kind of confirmed in his heart. But mm -hmm. also, Ellen White makes a comment. I think it'd be good for us to remember this too. That you know, this test came at a time when Abraham was old and was, you know, had, had the effects of age, and you know, he longed, you know, for rest more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Go, all, all, good, all good ideas, and we can talk about it more over, over lunch if, uh, if you guys want to. So, uh, so we're familiar with the story. We're familiar how the servants and Isaac, Isaac carried the wood up to the mountain, and Isaac asked his father, where is the, we have the fire, but where is the, the, the offering? You know, and, and Abraham said, God will provide himself uh, a lamb for a burnt offering. Go down uh, with me to verse uh, 15 and 16. And we know that God interposed. God interposed and stayed his hand when he had the knife raised. He was going to do it. He was going to obey God no matter what. And he was going to um, do God even though, like, like Tom said, it may have seemed impossible. That, um, I think Hebrews mentions that that Abraham believed that God could even raise him from the dead if, if, if he were to take the life of his son. So he demonstrated a great, a great faith in God, even though earlier he had demonstrated a lot, the lack of faith. And that's what, that's what caused him to, to go through. I'm sorry? What chapter are we in? We are in 22, Genesis 22. And we're going to read verse 15 and 16. Who wants to read that? Go ahead. So when God says, I have sworn, what is that? It's a promise. I have sworn. God promises. God's promises are him swearing to fulfill his word. He swore by a promise what he was going to do for Abraham. And then if we go down to verse 18, um, well, let's read 17 and 18. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Why? Because thou hast obeyed my voice. So God's promise was fulfilled in a, in a direct relation to Abraham obeying what God required. And so we have to take that into account. Um, and it's because he did not withhold his son, his only son from him. God said that. And we have to take that into account. And also that obedience is a progressive thing. God reveals light to you today. And if you do not walk in that light and obey that light, there's no promise that there's more light to come. You know, God says today is the day. Today is the, the time to make the choice and not to harden your heart and to, to walk in God's ways. Um, turn forward with me to Genesis chapter 26. And who would like to read verses 3 through 5? Mary, go ahead. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. How far? Uh, through five. So now God's renewing this covenant with the son of Abraham, Isaac, and saying, because he did this, this is what I'm going to fill. If we meet the conditions, God will fulfill his promises. There's no question about it. If we meet the conditions, he will fill, fulfill his promises. But not understanding the conditions can prevent us from fulfilling, can prevent us having them fulfilled in our lives, and it can nullify God's ability to perform it. You know, there's no lack in his ability. There's no, there's no lack in his promise. But we do have to meet those conditions. Let's look at a promise in the New Testament. 
Let's turn to Luke chapter 9, 11, I'm sorry. Luke chapter 11. And I'm sure, hopefully at this point, even though the promises that we may have in our bank are pennies, God has much more for us. I'm sure at this point you can plug in whatever promise it is that you need to claim from God. And you can know that if you meet the conditions, that God will fulfill his promise. Um, Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? What is the condition for receiving? Okay. What is the condition for finding? Seeking or looking. What is the condition for having the door open? Knock. That's right. And we read verse 13. If we just ask for the Holy Spirit, can God fulfill that? Is this a full picture? Or is this a partial picture? Certainly we do need to ask. And that's why we do pray for the Holy Spirit. But it's a partial picture. Are there any conditions beyond asking in the word of God to, to have his Holy Spirit? Okay, obedience, and, and that is true. Um, <clears throat> it's, okay, faith, that's, that's another one. So what I'm trying, the point that I'm trying to make is that if you, if you uh, claim a promise without knowing all the conditions, can God fulfill that promise? Do you not need, if you, if you enter into a contract, a promise, uh, God says, I have sworn. So when God swears, it's a, it's a contract. He's made a contract with Abraham. You do your part, I'll do mine. And God swears and he makes that promise. But what if we don't know all of the fine print in the contract? You have to know the conditions. We have to know the conditions. We have to know the conditions. Turn in your Bible with me to Acts chapter 5, verse 32. Acts 5.32 says, and we are his witnesses of these things. It's, it's talking about all of the things that uh, um, the disciples witnessed, of Jesus, raising Jesus from the dead and everything that Jesus went, went through. We are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Is it enough just to ask for the Holy Spirit? Is God going to give you his Holy Spirit, if you have no intention of obeying what the Holy Spirit reveals to you? No, it's not going to happen. We all have a, we all have a, uh, a measure of the Holy Spirit. We all have, just like we all have a measure of faith. But God cannot give us the fullness of his Spirit if we're not, you know, we all have the Spirit to convict us and, and to, to bring us to Christ. But God cannot... Uh, cannot pour out his Holy Spirit upon us if we're in disobedience to him. The condition of receiving the Holy Spirit, of course, is asking, knocking, and seeking, but it's also obeying. We can confirm this in John chapter 14. If you'll turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 14. 
Many people claim the Holy Spirit and they, uh, they claim the gifts of the Spirit. And if they are living up to all of the life that they know, I could, I could uh, understand that and understand that God can give you his spirit and pour his spirit out upon you if you're living up to all the light you have. Um, but if we're not walking in that light, it's an impossibility and we're going to find that out. John 14, verse 15 and 16. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And there's something right after that. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. What is Jesus' command? To, to love him, just like we love the Lord the God, our God with all of our heart, our neighbors, ourself. But if we do love him, what are we going to do? We're going to keep his commandments. That is the condition to have the Comforter or the Holy Spirit. It's confirmed again down in verses 21 and 23. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Who's being manifested to the believer? Christ. In verse 21, he says he's going to manifest himself to him. And then again in verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Who's, who's the we? Yes. Through the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son come and they make their abode with us. And that was one of the scriptures you want to say on the Trinity that mm -hmm. made the fact this morning that mm -hmm. you'll send the Comforter, meaning another person. But if you read in context of further on, the Comforter and is on us. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, Jesus said, if you look in um, verse 18, this is Jesus. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come. I will come. That's, that's correct. That's correct. So the point that I'm trying to make, there are conditions. Keep my words and the promises. My father will love you and we will come and make our abode with you. Many claim the promises without fulfilling the conditions. First, we need to make an effort to understand and to know what God's promises are. We need to exercise faith in those promises. And we need to fulfill the conditions so that God, it's not impossible for God to fulfill them. What a high destiny to be partakers of the divine nature through the promises of God. That's exactly what we're talking about here. Through the promises of God, we can be partakers of the divine nature of God himself. But we must not only know the promises, but the conditions for God to keep it. What is God's command? And what is his promise? Like you said, we will obey the one and we'll trust the other. up in my paperwork here. So let us do our part and know in knowing and grasping the promises of God by faith. Let us meet the conditions that allow God to do exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or think. Again, exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or think according to the power that works in us. And I think that's in Ephesians 3, if I remember right. Is that right? 320. Yes. 320. And let us behold Jesus and allow his spirit to transform us. We'll sing our closing hymn. Which is 532.
Thank you for giving your son Jesus to walk with us, to live within us. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for the measure of faith that you've given to each one of us. Lord, please enable us to obey your commands, to claim your promises, to have the glory and the virtue that you would have be seen in each of our lives to make us like Jesus. Please be with us as we go our separate ways and bless us during our week this week and be with our number and our family that is not here with us today and watch over them and keep them safe and bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
walk us through it. 